Hello everybody and welcome to our HIV 101 webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Introduction to HIV AIDS and this webinar is designed for all those who are interested in learning more about HIV and how the epidemic has progressed over the past three decades. My name is Stefan Perez and I'm the HIV Clinical Specialist with the National Center for HIV Care in Minority Communities and Health HIV. The learning objectives for today's webinar are to describe the timeline of HIV AIDS epidemic around the world and in the United States, to describe the basic epidemiology of HIV infection, describe the basic progression of HIV disease, explain how a standard HIV test works, and define how HIV is and is not transmitted. This disease is a disease that has had a profound personal, social, and global impact. HIV is a retrovirus that has had a lasting impact and began um, in originally in uh, 1959. We do have a case report of a man who died in Africa from an illness that was later confirmed to be HIV. The global pandemic began to make its mark in the United States as early as the late 1960s and early 1970s. The early 1980s saw the first diagnoses of opportunistic infections in the United States, including pneumocystis pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma, which eventually led to the discovery of a new disease process causing immune deficiency. This was originally called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. In the mid-1980s, it was discovered that the human immunodeficiency virus was the cause of this immunodeficiency. The mid-1980s also saw a high number of fatalities in the gay community, leading to much needed activism at the time. In the same time period, the first HIV test was also introduced. In the mid to late 1980s, we had significant increases in activism as well as high profile cases of HIV infection. In the mid 80s, Ryan White, a child with hemophilia, was banned from school um, and publicly spoke out about discrimination. He was infected uh, through blood transfusion. He died at the age of 18 in the late 1980s. Since that time, his mother has been a longstanding champion of HIV care and an advocate of access to services. The Ryan White Care Act provides HIV care to indigent patients in the United States living with and inf affected by HIV AIDS. It's important to note that in 1987, the U.S. shut its doors to infected immigrants and travelers, a ban which was recently lifted by the Obama administration. Also in the mid-1980s, AZT was the first antiretroviral therapy used to treat HIV and is still on the market today. The broadening impact of this disease was seen in the uh, MSM population, but also in women and intravenous drug users. The social impact of HIV in the media and in mainstream culture was very significant during this time period. Notable celebrities, including Rock Hudson, Liberace, and Magic Johnson, all came out as uh, all um, was, was learned had HIV infection and Rock Hudson and Liberace died of complications from AIDS. The red ribbon at this time was introduced as a symbol for HIV support and introduced at the Tony Awards in the early 1990s. As we moved into the mid to late 1990s, we began to see progress in treatment with the development of protease inhibitors and three drug therapy combinations. Um, in addition, significant global initiatives uh, related to the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic were introduced as well. Again, in 2009, travel bans were lifted uh, on HIV positive individuals in the United States. Also at this time, PEPFAR was introduced in order to help combat the epidemic on a global scale. In June, uh, June 2011, the 30-year anniversary of the first HIV AIDS case report in the United States was, um, was marked. Since that time, we have had great strides in HIV prevention and treatment. New infections are down greater than two-thirds since the height of the epidemic. However, the reality remains that there are approximately 50,000 new infections each year in the United States and greater than 1.2 million people living in the United States with HIV. There is still much work to be done, including work to reduce social stigma, 
increase testing in primary care settings, and provide prevention messages, in addition to the ideas of a possible cure and, an, and a generation that's AIDS-free. Some of the issues that we're facing here in the United States include primary care issues. These issues of primary care began largely because in 2006, the CDC expanded screening recommendations for HIV infection to all persons aged 13 to 64. More funding for testing and more diagnoses were made as a result of these expanded screening recommendations and also targeted screening programs in high volume medical settings, including emergency departments and labor and delivery floors. In addition, patients are presenting to primary care and specialty care with significantly high levels of complexity in their disease process. This is largely because of longer survival times, medical comorbidities, and late testing and diagnosis. Patients with HIV are also changing in terms of their geographic distribution. Many are moving from urban areas to rural areas where access to specialty care may be limited and the reliance on primary care becomes paramount. Trained HIV specialists are also not readily available in many areas. HIV is now viewed as a chronic care issue, and specialists are confronted with chronic comorbidities that patients are facing as they are living longer and aging with HIV. In addition, PCPs are also confronted with um, highly specialized infectious disease issues, including comorbid uh, infections with tuberculosis, hepatitis C, and or hepatitis B. HIV positive patients often need other specialty involvement, uh, for instance, endocrinology, surgical consultations, pulmonary consultations, or GI consultations, in which cases access becomes an issue. In addition, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was recently upheld by the Supreme Court, will potentially be bringing in many more HIV positive patients into primary medical care. In addition to some issues specifically targeted towards primary care, we also see an evolving, changing epidemic. We saw in earlier slides that the epidemic has changed significantly over the past three decades and continues to change today, not just in treatment advances, but in scientific knowledge that we've gained around the, um, uh, about the virus and its pathology in the body. In addition to those changes, we also see that the epidemic is changing in the aging of the HIV positive population. While young people continue to constitute the highest number of new infections, older adults and adults who were diagnosed many years ago with HIV infection are now beginning to age on antiretroviral therapy. People who have been living with HIV are aging into late adulthood. And with that aging, we see significant amounts of comorbid conditions, some of which are exacerbated by or perhaps in part related to the effects of long-term HIV infection and or antiretroviral therapy. By mid-decade, the CDC predicts that nearly half of the expected 1.5 million people in the United States living with HIV will be aged 50 and older. In addition to the changes that we just discussed, the epidemic is also changing in a biological and medical way. As mentioned before, we are currently seeing patients with multiple comorbid conditions as a result of aging and long-term HIV infection. We're now seeing patients with heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cirrhosis, and other liver disease, uh, neurocognitive impairments, and renal disease, as well as non-AIDS-associated malignancies. These conditions are perhaps exacerbated by current antiretroviral therapy, long-standing antiretroviral therapy, and long-standing HIV infection of, in and of itself. And research shows that it may is very likely a combination of all of these things, in addition to the stresses and premature aging in the immune system caused by chronic immune system activation, inflammation, and viral activity. Now that we've talked a little bit about the scope of the epidemic, let's talk a little bit about who is living with HIV here and abroad. This is information from the World Health Organization and an estimate of adults and children living with HIV in 2010. Approximately 
a million people around the world are living with HIV, some estimates as high as 35 million or more. As you can see, North America uh, approximately accounts for about 1.3 million, Latin America about 1.5 million, with Sub-Saharan Africa having the highest numbers at 22.9 million. When talking about the number of estimated new infections, we can see that North America, again, is consistent with what we were discussing at 58,000 new infections in 2010. And Sub-Saharan Africa continues to carry a large number of new infections at 1.9 million. South and Southeast Asia also have large numbers of new infections at 270,000. In addition, Eastern Europe and Central Asia has a large epidemic as well, with 160,000 new infections in 2010, almost triple the number of new infections that, took, that happened in the United States in that same year. Estimated adult and child death from, deaths from AIDS in 2010, in North America you can see uh, about 20,000, however in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 1.2 million, again, Eastern, European, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, 90,000 uh, estimated adult and child deaths from AIDS, and in Southeast Asia, approximately 250,000 uh, deaths from AIDS in 2010. Around the world, there are about 7,000 uh, new infections a day in 2010 with HIV. About 97% of those infections uh, were in low and middle income countries, and about 1,000 are in children 15 years of age um, or younger. About 6,000 in, in adults 15 years of age and, uh, and older. And when broken down, those numbers uh, can be broken down even further in that about 48% of new infections in that 6,000 number were among women, and about 42% were among young people, a large number, a large percentage of those new infections in the age 15 to 24 cohort. And that is something that we see in the United States as well. There's about 1.2 million people living in the United States currently with HIV AIDS. The number of new infections in 2010 was approximately 48,000. 18 percent of those infected with HIV do not know their status, and it's estimated that about 32 percent of people with HIV are diagnosed with advanced disease, and this includes an opportunistic infection or an AIDS-related uh, complication. And 50 percent of individuals who are aware of their HIV status are not adequately involved in care. This, of course, referring to the HIV care cascade, um, that was published in 2010 uh, by Gardner. In addition to the numbers previously mentioned, MSM continued to carry the highest burden of new and current of infections in the United States. Women accounted for 23% uh, of new infections in 2009 in the United States. And people of color continued to be disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS. Young people, similar to what we saw in the um, world statistics, in the international statistics, young people less than 30 years old accounted for 39% of new infections in 2009, the highest percentage of any age group in the United States. Here we have a slide that shows the rates of diagnosis of HIV infection among adults and adolescents by sex and race and, race and ethnicity. And this is a significant slide because it depicts, it depicts the racial and ethnic disparities of this disease in the United States. As you can see in males, African Americans constituted the highest rates of diagnosis of HIV infection in 2010 among adults and adolescents. And in females, African Americans again constituted the highest rates of HIV infections among adolescents and adults. In regards to the percentage of AIDS diagnosis among adults and adolescents, when looked at by race and ethnicity, we can see that um, over the past, uh, since, since 1985, over the past 25 years or so, the number of AIDS diagnosis among, ad among white adults has significantly dropped whereas the number of African-American AIDS diagnosis among adults and adolescents has risen in the same time period. In addition, the number of Hispanic and Latino 
uh, AIDS diagnosis has also risen in that same time period, although not as significantly as it has in black and African Americans um, in the United States. This slide um, very powerfully dis depicts the um, uh, disproportionate effect of HIV infection um, on uh, um, on race and ethnicity in this country. As you can see, African Americans in the United States make, just, make up just 12% of the population uh, in the United States. However, they, make up, they made up 44% of new infections in 2009. So that's a huge disparity um, between their total makeup in the U.S. population and um, the number of new infections that they constituted in 2009. This slide looks at the rates of diagnosis of HIV infection among adults and adolescents, and this is in 2010. And as you can see, the highest rates of HIV infection continue to be in the South. Um, those, those states that are in orange, um, Louisiana, uh, Georgia, and Florida, and also New York and New Jersey, but particularly Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida had the highest rates of HIV infection um, among the 46 states and five U.S. dependent areas that are reporting here. Um, and this is, uh, they are closely followed by other, uh, other southern states as well as surrounding states um, that constitute very high rates of HIV uh, infection and diagnosis in 2010. This graphic looks at the awareness of sero status, meaning whether or not um, people are aware uh, that they are HIV positive or HIV negative among people with HIV and how that relates to the estimates of transmission. And as you can see, it's estimated that about 25% of people are unaware of um, their status, so they're unaware that they're HIV positive. And of um, and those 25% are responsible for approximately 54% of new infections, um, um, at whereas 75% who are aware of their infection uh, are aware of their sero status um, um, are only um, or are responsible for about 46% of new infections. So as you can see, a very small number um, uh, of people living with HIV. Um, are related to a larger number of, um, of new infections when looking at it um, in this method. Now that we've discussed who in this country and around the world is living with HIV, we're going to be talking about how HIV is and is not transmitted. It's important to remember that HIV is only transmitted through certain body fluids, and those fluids are blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. These specific fluids must come in contact with the mucous membrane or damaged tissue or be directly injected into the bloodstream from a needle or a syringe for transmission to possibly occur. It's important to remember that when counseling our patients or when discussing with our clients how HIV is and is not transmitted, that we readily dispel any myths about how HIV can be transmitted from one person to the other. HIV is not spread by air or water insects, including mosquitoes and other biting insects, saliva, including spitting, tears, or sweat. It cannot be spread by casual contact, like shaking hands, hugging, or sharing dishes, and it cannot be spread by closed mouth or social kissing. This is a risk um, per exposure list for specific activities and events, um, and this, what this graphic is basically trying to describe is what types of exposures are at higher are, uh, at highest risk for HIV infection. And as you can see, um, it's very difficult to quantify this risk because it is variable on so many variable uh, on so many different factors based on so many different factors, including whether or not the patient um, who is HIV infected is on antiretroviral therapy, whether or not they are adherent to their antiretroviral therapy. Um, there's many different things that can affect um, transmissibility of HIV in all of these different situations. However, this just serves as sort of a method of looking at types of risk exposures and what the risk per exposure percentage could be.
this graphic also looks at um, different types of activities, uh, but tries to quantify the same type of risk exposure. As you can see, out of all of these uh, risk exposures, the highest risks are those that come with a blood transfusion from contaminated blood and, in, and injection drug use. This slide deals with some of the risks that may be involved um, for occupational exposures. This information is mainly to be used for providers in assessing risk from potential workplace injury or exposure. But if confronted by a workplace injury or exposure, it's very important to contact the National Clinician's Consultation Center. Now that we've spoken a little bit about um, HIV disease and who is living with HIV in this country and around the world and how HIV is transmitted, we're going to talk a little bit about HIV itself and what exactly it is, how it reproduces in the body, and how it causes disease. First, we have to learn the ABCs of HIV AIDS. And as many of you have seen already, there are a lot of different abbreviations that we use in order to talk about a lot of different things when it comes to HIV and AIDS. The first one is obviously HIV, and that stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. The next is AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And we're going to be discussing the differences between those two things. Heart or highly active antiretroviral therapy um, stands f um, is um, the name that we give to um, combination antiretroviral therapy. Sometimes we abbreviate heart by just saying antiretroviral therapy. Heart became a well used term, uh, a widely used term rather, um, with the advent of three drug combination. Now, for the purposes of most um, uh, most uh, references, we simply refer to antiretroviral therapy, or ART, A-R-T. Um, you'll sometimes see the words viral load, abbreviated as VL, and you'll often see CD4 in reference to a CD4 cell or CD4 count, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And CD4 is an acronym for cluster of differentiation. That is something that you will rarely see, if ever see, in use in terms of the actual term cluster of differentiation. So what is HIV? Well, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. Infection with this virus causes damage to the immune system, which is the body's protection system. This leaves people very highly vulnerable to other infections that might otherwise not cause illness in healthy patients. It can also cause long-term inflammation and damage to other body systems. Now we talk about what is AIDS. AIDS refers to the state of disease when a person's immune system is very compromised, meaning it doesn't work well. This is often after long-standing infection with the HIV virus. Sometimes we know this because the CD4 count is low or because they have what we call an opportunistic infection. This is a picture of the HIV viral particle itself. As you can see, there are a lot of different components to the HIV virus. Some of these components are proteins, some of these components are enzymes, but all of these components in some way contribute to how the virus infects the cell and how the virus replicates in the cell. Some of the characteristics of HIV are that it is a retrovirus and it is the most prevalent retrovirus in the world. It has its own genetic material, its own genes, if you will, that it uses to make copies of itself, of itself using our own cells' machinery. And it has very special enzymes that it, helps, that you, it uses to help make copies of itself once it's in our own CD4 cell. In addition, it can incorporate viral DNA, its own viral genetic material, into our genome. And this is what makes it a retrovirus. And this is why HIV can be very difficult to treat and cure, because it can hide its own viral genome into ours. And so it makes it a very difficult to target those cells where HIV is hiding. The way that I like to think about HIV is by thinking about it as sort of a robot spy. And what is the most famous robot that I can think of? Well, that's the Terminator. 
The Terminator is a robot, and for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to say that the Terminator is a robot whose mission is to make other robots over and over and over again. But the Terminator um, is just a robot, and it can't make other copies of itself without using our bodies and our cells. And what are the cells that it most often uses to do this? Well, that's called the CD4 cell. And the CD4 cell is, um, it, is refers to a group of cells that have a CD4 receptor site on them. So that's what we mean when we say CD4 cell. It just means a type of immune system cell that has a CD4 receptor site on it. It does have other types of receptor sites that HIV can use to bind to the cell. However, the CD4 cell is the major receptor site. And CD4 is the CD4 cell, sometimes called the T cell, is really the major target of HIV infection. These CD4 cells are the ones that are destroyed or damaged during HIV replication. One of the questions that we most often receive is what is a normal CD4 count? And a normal CD4 count, quote unquote, or a CD4 count um, in people who don't have HIV infection is typically 600 to 1200. However, CD4 counts can vary very, very widely from person to person, regardless of their HIV infection or not. CD4 counts are often affected by other external, um, external stressors, including other illnesses, stress, disturbance in sleep patterns, and even time of day. It's very important when counseling your patient around what is a, quote, normal CD4 count to include um, uh, this information. And I like to think about, about a CD4 cell as sort of a battleship because it does have a protection factor in the body. It is an immune system cell, and it is responsible for helping us to mount a, defect, uh, an, uh, a defense against foreign invaders. But a CD4 cell is also um, like a battleship in that it has a lot of different working machinery inside of it, and it has a lot of different processes that go along, that go on inside of the cell. And it's important to remember that because sometimes these CD4 cells, uh, or excuse me, sometimes the virus, or all the time the virus, uses those processes and takes over those processes to make replicas of itself. And this is done through HIV viral replication. The virus, in effect, takes over the CD4 cell through a series of steps. And during that time, it uses the, the CD4 cell's own machinery to make more copies of the virus. So in effect, it takes over the cell and uses its own machinery within that battleship to make more copies of itself. If you're using the robot analogy, it's like the robot taking over the battleship to use the battleship's machinery to make more copies of the robot. And the reason that I am showing this diagram is because this shows all of the different steps of HIV replication. As you can see, there are many. And it's important to remember that each of these, that, that these steps are where the antiretroviral therapy work. So the antiretroviral therapy works on each of these steps in the replication cycle. Some medications work on some of the steps, others work on, others of, on other parts of the, of the replication cycle. And they all come together to create combination therapy. So essentially, it's stopping the robot in its tracks at, in the assembly line, in the entry point, um, and all different phases of the, of the replication cycle. And that's very important because patients often say, well, why do I have to take so many different medications? Why can't I just take one medicine? And it's because to get the best effect from the antiretroviral therapy and guard against resistance, we have to use medications that act on all different points of this replication cycle in order to effectively stop HIV in its tracks. Once HIV infects the cell and once a patient becomes infected with HIV, it goes through a progression in the body. And this is what we call the natural history of HIV infection. And the natural history of HIV infection simply refers to the progression of HIV infection in the patient if the patient were not to have any antiretroviral therapy. So if the disease was not treated, this is what the progression would look like. And as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, there is a time of primary HIV infection, 
And this is typically within the first six weeks when after the person becomes infected with HIV. And they typically get symptomatic and can have an acute retroviral syndrome, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Next, they go through a period of clinical latency. This is where a patient may not feel sick for many, many years, but the virus is slowly replicating in the body. And then eventually, as the CD4 count begins to get begins to decline as a result of ongoing damage from the virus, the risk for opportunistic infection and death pro uh, increases and, and progression to death can be very rapid. So again, early on in the infection process, primary infection or acute retroviral syndrome can occur about two to six weeks after infection. Persons sometimes feel like they have a very bad flu. It's important to remember that during this phase, antibodies to HIV may not be present, so a standard HIV test may be negative. Then, once, or once acute retroviral syndrome has passed, the patient typically, after a few months, goes into a period of clinical latency. This is when the body begins to somewhat control the virus. They may have no signs or symptoms of any uh, of, the, of HIV infection, and this period can last for 10 years or more. However, it's important to know that the HIV is still replicating in the body, usually at low levels. However, all the time it's doing damage to the CD4 count, and eventually that CD4 count does begin to fall. Now, keeping in mind that a, a quote-unquote normal CD4 count is about 600 to 1,200, um, we begin to see the CD4 counts fall to below 350 and eventually below 200, at which point we call this AIDS. And this is the point at the disease process when significant opportunistic infections um, can occur, particularly at CD4 counts below 200. At CD4 counts below 50, very dangerous malignancies as well as very dangerous opportunistic infections can also occur, and progression to death can be very rapid. In addition, AIDS-related um, illnesses, including wasting, dementia, or GI issues, can predominate during this phase as well. And again, death is likely without proper treatment. In discussing opportunistic infections, it's important to remember that these are infections that most often don't cause um, infections in patients who don't have HIV or who have healthy immune systems. These are infections that take the opportunity to cause problems in a person when their immune system is so depressed from, um, from HIV that it can no longer mount a response to these infections. In particular, some of the more, quote, famous opportunistic infections are, include Carposi sarcoma, pneumocystis pneumonia, or toxoplasmosis. As you can see, some of the um, opportunistic infections can begin with CD4 counts that are relatively higher, including CD4 counts that are between 200 and 500. You can see um, difficult to treat um, um, onychomycosis, which is um, a toenail fungus, uh, difficult to um, treat uh, uh, or particularly um, significant gingivitis or seborrheic dermatitis. You can also even see thrush at some of these levels. In addition, you may see exacerbations at higher CD4 counts of cro other chronic infectious diseases, including zoster and um, uh, herpes simplex. Once the CD4 count falls below 200, then you can see some of the more significant and life-threatening inf um, opportunistic infections, including the ones we mentioned earlier. Now that we know a little bit more about the progression of HIV disease, let's talk about who do we treat and when is treatment indicated for our patients and clients. Well, recently, in March of 2012, the DHHS guidelines changed, and antiretroviral therapy is now recommended for all HIV-infected individuals. And the strength of this recommendation varies on the basis of pretreatment CD4 cell count. So for those who are of CD4 count um, less than 350, we should always be working to treat those and start treatment um, as soon as possible. However, the recent recommendations again did suggest and does recommend that all patients who have HIV infection do be treated or offered antiretroviral therapy regardless of CD4 count. However, there are some more, quote, compelling reasons to begin antiretroviral therapy sooner than later. These include 
uh, pregnancy, a history of, a non, of an AIDS-defining illness, including those opportunistic infections that we discussed earlier, HIV-associated nephropathy, which is a kidney, um, which is which is kidney damage and kidney disease that can be associated from HIV viral infection, and hepatitis B co-infection. It's important to remember that effective antiretroviral therapy has also been shown to prevent transmission of HIV from an infected individual to a sexual partner. Therefore, ART should be offered to patients who are at risk of transmitting HIV to sexual partners. And this is also a new uh, guideline um, from this year. As you can see, we have many, many, many different options and many, many good, solid options to treat our patients with HIV infection. This is a list of currently available antiretroviral therapy in the United States, and we do have more on the way. As you can see, they're broken up into um, different classes. However, there is an, another class that, uh, that um, in which, all of, which some of these fall into, and that's a class of fixed dose combinations. And these are medications that have two or three, and soon to be four, um, medications combined into one pill. This makes it much easier for the patient to take and improves the patient's adherence. Now that we've talked a little bit about some of the available treatments and also who we should be offering treatment to, let's talk a little bit about how to test and who to test. Testing can be sometimes a little bit complex in the landscape of HIV AIDS. And it's important to know that there are a lot of different types of HIV testing out there. We have rapid testing, we have Western blot or confirmatory testing, we have antibody testing which falls into rapid testing, and then we have viral testing where we actually test for the presence of the virus. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to be focusing on the standard, quote unquote, standard HIV test, which is the antibody test. And the antibody test is typically called an ELISA or an EIA. And this test is looking for antibodies to HIV, which are typically detectable within six to eight weeks of infection. This is the usual screening test for HIV infection and is the typical screening test for any test drawn in the clinic or any um, rapid test performed in the clinic or um, at an uh, external site. Uh, the conventional test can use serum or oral fluid, which is typically sent to a lab, and if the lab detects the HIV antibodies, it will send a test that is called a Western blot. And this Western blot test serves as a confirmatory test for the preliminary positive anti uh, antibody test. Uh, antibody tests also are available as rapid tests, in, um, and this can use whole blood plasma or oral fluid, and the results can be returned in about 10 to 20 minutes. It's important to remember, however, that if you do have a positive antibody test or a positive rapid test in the clinic, you must send the sample out for a confirmatory uh, ELISA and Western blot. Screening for HIV infection, again, should take place in healthcare settings and in the population, or excuse me, should in, in healthcare settings, screening should take place in the population of all patients aged 13 to 64 years. That is per the CDC guidelines. This is, of course, unless the prevalence of undiagnosed HIV infection in their patients has been documented to be less than 1%. All patients initiating treatment for TB should be screened routinely for HIV infection. All patients seeking treatment for STDs should also be screened routinely for HIV infection. And of course, any patients who are pregnant um, uh, or present to labor and delivery without a recent history of testing should be pregnant. Excuse me, should be tested. <laughs> um, so who else do, should we test and what is this issue of repeat screening? Well, repeats, repeat screening should be done annually, at least annually for patients who are quote unquote at risk. And some of these patients can include injection drug users, their sex partners, persons who engage in sex for money or drugs, anybody who's had a new partner or new sexual relationship within the past few months, sex partners of HIV infected patient, uh, persons, including those who may be on pre-exposure prophylaxis, men who have sex with men or heterosexual persons who themselves 
um, or whose sex partners have had more than one sex partner since their most recent HIV test. And of course, any time your clinical judgment um, suggests that you may need to screen or t um, a, a patient for HIV infection. In summary, HIV infection rates are steady. However, it, HIV disproportionately affects MSM and people of color. Around the world, great progress has been made, but much needs to be done in the face of a changing epidemic. HIV is only transmitted through specific types of contact and through certain body fluids. It's important to remember that HIV and AIDS are not the same thing and hold important differences in prognosis. HIV life cycle and disease progression is complex, but it's important to understand the disease processes in order to understand the treatments that are available. Also, remember that the primary methods for HIV testing is to test for HIV antibodies. However, early on in the disease process, these tests may be negative. And finally, screening and treatment guidelines have moved towards universal testing and treatment. So if your clinical judgment suggests that you should be testing, go ahead and test. That's it for this webinar. If you have any questions about this webinar or any questions about any of the other ones, please feel free to contact me at stephan at healthhiv.org. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N at healthhiv.org. And I thank you very much for your participation today.